to welcome uh, uh, Geza Tot, whose, whose name uh, happens to be missing from the slide. Uh, <laughs> That's the joint work. <laughs> That's the joint, so his name is joint work. So he is, um, uh, he is an uh, expert on these um, combinatorial geometry questions including uh, geometric extremal problems on geometric graphs. And uh, this is a uh, um, particular, we, we, I found this problem very interesting, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Geza will uh, try to convince you too. And uh, what else about him? He, uh, he is uh, omnipresent in Hungary because uh, he's a professor at uh, the Technical University. And at the same time, he is the head of the geometry uh, group at uh, Rain Institute. So in this capacity, uh, he is my boss. So it's, a, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce him to all these people who know him as well as I do. So thanks for coming to Moscow, Geza. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's a very strange occasion uh, to give a talk because this war just broke out, but I try to uh, concentrate on my slides in mathematics. Uh, one question, is it is it the same uh, this way? And uh, I do something now. Is there any difference? Now it's better. Now it's because better. It's full screen now, so it's ah. So you see if it's full screen or not. Okay, that's what yes. I didn't know that. Okay, so I leave it like this. Okay. Of course. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I uh, would like to talk about. Okay. So I would like to talk about these jointness graphs of segments and polygonal chains, joint work with Janos and Gabor Tardos. Actually, I never wanted to be the boss of Janos. I am just, uh, I was forced to be the boss of him. <laughs> uh, but it's not, not that bad. So uh, the two most important parameters here, graph parameters uh, are uh, omega, which is the omega of G. G is a graph. Omega G is the click number, which is the size of the largest complete subgraph of the graph. And chi is the chromatic number. And uh, it's clear that for any graph, uh, chi is greater or equal than omega. Because if you have a complete subgraph of some size, then even that subgraph needs uh, omega colors. So, so this is true for everyone. So to figure out how to. I hear you not so well, Giz. No, is it oh, I'm for, sorry. for others? It, I try to go, go closer to the computer. Is it okay now? Now it's good, yeah. Okay, so I will be, I have to figure out how to, ah, with the mouse. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Somehow I couldn't uh, change the page. Okay, so, so yeah, so there are graphs. Uh, it's well known. There are graphs that where uh, these two parameters are very far from each other. Omega is two. There are graphs where omega is two, which means that the graph doesn't contain a triangle. And chi, the chromatic number is arbitrarily large. There are many such constructions. Uh, here are a few of them. The shift graph, Zikov construction, Michalski, Burling's construction, random construction, and there are some others. Uh, now there is a very interesting definition by Jarfash and Lehel from 83. Uh, if we have a graph class, just a collection of graphs, uh, we say that this graph class is chi bounded. If, <clears throat> uh, if there is a function f, uh, so that chi is 
uh, smaller than some function that that function of omega. In other words, uh, graph class is chi bounded if uh, the chromatic number is bounded in terms of the uh, click number. So in other in other words, this cannot happen, which is here uh, that uh, omega is two or some other fixed number, and at the same time the chromatic number goes to infinity. That cannot happen. Okay, the most uh, the basic example for chi bounded class is the perfect graphs. Uh, there is the most <laughs> most chi bounded, if you can say, uh, because there for every perfect graph chi is equal to omega. Uh, so in other words, this f x equals x function. Okay, so that's the most basic example for chi bounded classes, uh, and in this sense uh, we can say that uh, the class uh, is sky bounded if it is in some sense close to perfect graphs so if uh, in some sense it is almost perfect okay. uh, so in this talk we will investigate some uh, graphs uh, which are defined by some geometric means intersections or disjointness graphs of some geometric objects Probably the easiest example is this uh, intersection graph of intervals on a line. So you take a lot of intervals on a line and you can define the intersection graph. So the vertices correspond to the intervals and they are connected if uh, the, the intervals intersect each other. And it's a relatively easy proof. It's very relatively easy to see that these graphs are always perfect. So <clears throat> chi is equal to omega. So of course it means that they are chi bounded, and then it also follows that the complement of this graph, uh, which is uh, the disjointness graph of these graphs, that's also perfect. You can easily prove it directly, but uh, it follows from the weak perfect graph. This is perfect. The intersection graph is perfect, and the disjointness graph is also. <coughs> These are probably the most basic such geometric examples. Now let's see uh, generalization. Let's go to two dimensions. We take axis parallel boxes, so rectangles uh, whose sides are uh, parallel to the axis, x and y axis, in the plane. In the, we are in the plane. And let's take the intersection graph. And it was proved uh, 60 years ago by Ostrund and Greenbaum that this class of graphs is also chi bounded. Uh, chi is at most 8 omega squared. That's what they did. And it was proved, it was improved 60 years later, last year, by, well, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Chalemsok or Parinya uh, Chalemsok, probably something like that, uh, and Barkos uh, Varchak. That's, that's <laughs> surely pronounced like this. Uh, so, in a very nice paper, they improved it to omega log omega. Paper. Now, there was a very surprising result by Burling, that was his PhD thesis, that the generalization in higher dimensions is not true. It's the opposite case. So if you go to the space, you take boxes, axis parallel boxes, then the intersection graph, class of intersection graph is not chi bounded. He constructed uh, boxes where the intersection graph has no triangle, omega is two, and the chromatic number goes to infinity. Very surprising. If we take the uh, disjointness graph of axis parallel boxes, then it is not hard to prove that they are chi bounded. Uh, chi is at most omega times log to the d minus one omega. Uh, that's what you can prove. Uh, it is not known to be sharp, but that's what you can prove relatively easily by induction on the dimension. 
Okay. Now we go to another uh, direction. We keep the segments, uh, but uh, we increase the dimension. Uh, so let's see the intersection graph of segments in the plane. Uh, there was a very surprising, very nice construction by uh, its many authors, Pavlik, Kozik, Kravchik, Lazon, Nicek, Trotter and Valchak, uh, eight years ago. Quite surprising that uh, that class of so intersection graph of seg segments the plane, that class is not tie bounded. Actually, they realized the same graph as uh, appears in Burling's construction. So Burling uh, realized some graphs with this property by as a intersection graph of boxes, and they realized the same graph as intersection graph of segments. Okay, so the interesting question now is the disjointness graph. Disjointness graphs of segments in the plane. Uh, Janos and uh, Janu Törölcsit proved in 94 that they are tie bounded. I will show you the basic, basically, I, show, I will show you the proof. Uh, they are chi bounded. Uh, chi is at most omega to the four. Now we don't know if this is sharp or not, but uh, I forgot to write it here. Uh, if uh, instead of segments, we have X monoton curves, then we know that it is sharp. That was proved by Janos and uh, Tomon. But for segments, it is not, uh, not known to be sharp. Maybe it can be improved. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I will talk about some other generalizations, uh, especially generalizations of this result and this result or other disjointness graphs. So here is a little summary of what we know. So we saw that uh, disjointness graphs of segments in, ah, we didn't see, see. <laughs> I'm just telling you, we will see it later, sorry. Uh, so if we take segments in the d-dimensional space, then it is also chi-bounded, almost with the same uh, function. We could prove almost the same function, omega to the four, and then we have this strange term, omega cube. Most likely it is just of technical reasons, but we couldn't get rid of it. So omega to the four plus omega cube is an upper bound for the chromatic number for this jointness graph of segments in uh, three or more higher dimensions. If instead of segments, you take lines in D dimension, well, if you take lines in uh, two dimensions, then it's not an interesting question. If you take lines in uh, three or higher dimensions, then we could prove that it is a, there is a cubic upper bound. So it is chi bound. Now, if instead of segments, you take these polygonal paths, which we call V-shapes, polygonal paths of two segments, like this, the two segments, then it, the answer becomes no. Uh, so we can construct disjointness graph of disjointness graphs of V-shapes uh, with no triangle and unbounded chromatic number. It is also true if we if one of the uh, sides of the V is, is uh, the half line, then we have less degree of freedom, but it is still true. So a segment and the half line, this is called, uh, at least we call it long V-shapes, it is still true. On the other hand, if both sides are long, say double long V-shape, then uh, it changes back to, the answer changes back to yes. So then the chromatic number is at most omega cube. Moreover, even if we have a segment and two half lines, it is still uh, upper bounded by a function, uh, omega cube plus omega. But if you have two segments and two half lines, then it, it is no. So in this sense, we know almost everything in this, this uh, so where, when, where is the limit? 
between uh, chi bounded and not chi bounded. Still, there are many questions I will mention. So I will I will just tell you the main ideas of some of the proofs. Uh, let me start with this old Pachterochik uh, proof because we use it often in the later proofs. So let's see the disjointness graph of segments in the plane. For, for the disjointness graph of segments in the plane, we have chi at most uh, omega t at four. That's the that's the theory. So we have a lot of segments in the plane. The maximum number of pairwise disjoint segments is omega. That's a proof number. And we want to color the segments with omega to the four values. And the idea of the proof is uh, this partial order. That's the, that's the big idea here. Uh, they defined four partial orders. Uh, it's more or less clear from the picture, but let me explain it a little bit. So suppose we are in a coordinate system. There is an X axis and Y axis. And let's project, let's take two disjoint segments, say E and F. And I project them on the X axis. And the endpoints can have basically four different orders. I mean, not, not four different orders, but if I compare the left endpoints, and I also compare the right endpoints, then there are four possibilities. These are the four possibilities, right? Um, so I compare these uh, four possibilities. And I say that the first partial order is that E is smaller than F. If this is the order, so that E starts before F and ends before F. And if there is an overlap in the projection, then E is below F. That's the first partial order. Uh, similarly, this is the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. Is it okay? The orders? And, uh, well, it's not hard to see that these are partial orders. Imagine that, for example, here is F, here is E, and there is also a third one, G, somewhere here, smaller than uh, E. Then G is also smaller than F in this partial order. It's transitive. It's that not very hard to check. Or here, if somebody something is smaller than E, that means it's a very short segment somewhere here, then it's also smaller than F in the third partial order. So these are three par four partial orders. And it's not hard to see that if uh, two segments are disjoint, then they are comparable by one of these partial orders. In this case, for example, they are comparable by two partial orders. Right here, E is smaller than F, and also F is smaller than E in the second one. So these are this is an overlap, but it doesn't matter. Any two disjoint segments are comparable by one of them, and uh, only disjoint segments are comparable. Okay, that's the main idea of their proof. Uh, so if we take a set of segments at most omega pairwise disjoint, then let's consider the first partial order. The maximum chain has length at most omega, right? Because there are no more than omega disjoint segments. So uh, the set of segments can be decomposed into omega anti chains, set of sets which are not comparable by the first partial order. Then for each anti chain, I continue with the second one. I compare, e I, I decompose each anti chain to omega anti chains with respect to the second order. Then now I have omega square subsets, and I continue with omega uh, with uh, the third partial order and the fourth partial order, and eventually I get omega to the four subsets and e of edges, and each subset is an anti-chain for all of the four partial orders, which means that uh, they are not comparable by any of these four relations. Therefore, they are pairwise crossing. So uh, these segments, each class of the omega four to the four, each class can be colored with the same color because in the disjointness graph, they are not uh, connected. So I managed to color all the segments with omega to the four colors. That's that was it. Now, let me sketch a similar result. 
disjoint dense graph of segments in the space. Well, first, okay, so you have a lot of segments in the space and you want to color the disjoint dense graph with some uh, bounded number of colors in terms of one graph. Actually, that's the bound proof. The first idea after that proof would be that uh, if you can somehow define uh, similarly as in the plane, you can define k partial order, say 1 million partial orders among disjoint segments, so that uh, any two disjoint segments are comparable by at least one of them. Only disjoint segments are comparable. And that's it. This two. And there are, say, 1 million. Partial order. So you decompose the disjointness into 1 million partial orders. Then you could prove that uh, chi is at most omega to the 1 million, right? The same way. Now, up to, so the, to the best of our knowledge, it is not known. Uh, it is not known if disjointness, the disjointness relation among segments in the space can be decomposed into 1 million partial orders or any bounded number of partial orders. We don't know any bound. It's very strange. Uh, it shouldn't, that, that's my first problem. Can you decompose the disjointness relation in this, for segments in the space into k partial orders for any large k? We don't have any such decomposition. Nevertheless, we could still prove this uh, omega to the four plus omega cube uh, using a different method, uh, which uses the planar case recursively. Uh, now I, I sketch the idea. Uh, so I want to prove that uh, for segments in the space, uh, chi is at most omega to the four plus omega cube. Now I won't prove it because it's a little bit technical. Instead, I prove something much easier, which is, uh, which is much nicer as well. So let's simplify the problem. Disjointness graphs of lines in the space instead of segments. Uh, so you take lines in the space and uh, you define the same way this joint as graph. And that for that, we can prove, or we can prove whatever, uh, chi is at most omega cube. But uh, I simplify it further before proving it uh, for first step. So the following even simpler problem. You take lines, uh, in the projective space. So it's a Euclidean space, but you extend it with the points at infinity. So parallel lines also uh, intersect. And Euclidean parallel lines uh, also intersect each other. Okay, so, so now let's consider the lines in the projective space. And let's assume that all the lines we are talking about intersect a fixed line L. So there is a fixed line L. So that's a very special case. Let's just consider this. There is a fixed line L and all our lines, say L1, L2, Lm, all intersect this line, this red line, this uh, L. All of them intersect. And now I consider the disjointness graph of this, these lines in the projective space. And for that, Let's prove that in this case, uh, the disjointness graph is perfect. So chi is equal to omega. So I will color all these lines with uh, omega colors. It's, uh, let's see, this is a nice proof. So let's take the lines, these uh, black lines, L1, Lm. Now, all of them intersect the red line, L. Let's let P1, P2, and so on, PA be the intersection point. So they intersect uh, this red line in these P1, PA points. Uh, yes, so, sorry, when you say projective space, you mean yes. three dimensional projective space. Yes, yes, right? yes, 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 yes. So it's uh, basically it's uh, the same. So we are in the originally 
or for the original problem, we are in the Euclidean space. And now I uh, extend all the lines, uh, I mean, all the space with the lines at infinity uh, to get a three dimensional projective space. Okay. And so now I consider the problem there in the projective space. Then I go back to the Euclidean later. Okay. So here are these intersection points, P1, P A. Of course, A might be much smaller than M because there, are, there could be many lines which intersect the red line at the same point, obviously. So these are just the intersection lines. So it doesn't mean that P1 co uh, co uh, corresponds to L1 and so on. These are just the intersection points, okay? And similarly, let's define the planes determined by sum of these one of one of these lines plus l so two lines the red line and the black line together uh, determine a plane right and that those those planes are uh, denoted by q1 and so on qb so again it's possible that uh, one of these q's corresponds to many of the lines so two lines determine the same plane with the red line. Okay, so I have these objects, intersection points and planes, and now I define a bipartite multigraph. Uh, the vertices will be these points, P1, P2, PA, and Q1 and the planes, Q1, QB, these are the vertices. And then each of these black lines, say L, I, corresponds to an edge the corresponding intersection and the corresponding plane. Okay, so there could be multiple edges. It's possible that two lines correspond to the same intersection and the same plane, it's okay. So it's a bipartite multigraph. These are four flow points, planes, and these, the edges are the lines. Okay, and now observe that if two lines of these black lines, L, I, and L, J, two lines intersect, that can happen in two different ways. Uh, remember that both of them intersect the red line. So they intersect either, uh, so that there could be two reasons that they intersect. Either they, have a, they intersect the red line in a common point, so they go in the common point, or uh, they determine the same plane. They are coplanar. They are in the same plane. So L, L, I, and L, J are all in the same plane. Uh, these are the possible two reasons for, in, for uh, the lines to intersect, the uh, two black lines. Now, it corresponds to this kind of configuration. So it's a, it co corresponds to a common endpoint of the edges. So the first case corresponds to a common Q. The second case co corresponds to a common P. But this shouldn't be if and only if, no? Because L, I, and L, J might be parallel, right? But it's projective. Oh, I see. Okay. Actually, that's why we went to the projective. Uh, yeah. So these are the possible reasons of intersections. Okay. Now we have this uh, bipartite graph, and. Uh, <clears throat> so omega is the maximum number of pairwise non-crossing lines which is the same by the previous observation and is the maximum number of independent edges in this graph, bipartite graph, edges with no common endpoint. And by the Koenig, Koenig Hall theorem, it is the same as the minimum number of covering vertices. So you can pick omega vertices, some of them from here and some of them from here, which cover all the edges. But uh, what does it mean? It means that all, all of that, that also gives you a coloring because it means, it means that you have a certain omega points, some of them here and some of them there. And you say that all lines, all, all of these points, uh, discovering points correspond to one of the colors. And no edge avoids these covering points that the definition of covering points. So all edges are covered. And if two, are colored. And if two uh, edges have a common endpoint, uh, then they color the same. So this is a proper color. 
if they are independent, then they are color differences. Okay, so this means that uh, <clears throat> in this very special case, it is perfect. Now let's see a slightly more general case. Let's take lines in the projective space, but now we, I don't assume that they all intersect a, a red line. Then the, for the disjointness graph, we have chi less than or equal than uh, omega squared. It's very easy. You just take a maximum set of disjoint lines. Uh, here I, I made a mistake. I said L1, L A, and A is at most omega. Actually, it's, A is equal to omega, right? That's the definition of omega. Uh, omega is the maximum number of uh, independent lines, non-crossing lines. So you take L, sorry for this mistake. So you take L1, L omega, which is a maximum set of uh, non-crossing lines, and all the other lines uh, <clears throat> intersect one of them. So I just have to apply the previous result omega times, and you, I color them with omega square colors. Is it okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Yeah. So the, the next uh, one more step about this. Let's go back to the Euclidean space. So now I take a lot of lines in the Euclidean space and I want to color them with omega cube colors uh, by applying the previous results. Actually, I don't know how to go back. How to, sorry, now I made a mistake because I, oh, oh, okay. At the beginning, the arrows didn't work. <laughs> now they do. Sorry for my uh, limited intelligence. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> lines in the Euclidean space, and I want to apply this uh, result, lines in the projective space. So let's take the lines in the project, in the Euclidean space. This is the maximum number of, uh, non-crossing lines. And let's consider them for a minute as lines in the projective space. Then the new omega, omega of G, G prime, is uh, it cannot increase, right? The only difference is that parallel lines also cross. So the, the click number can only decrease. So if I consider them as lines in the projective space, then I can color them with omega squared colors. Now let's go back to the <clears throat> let's go back to the uh, Euclidean space uh, and let's consider one color class. Uh, the only difference is that there could be sets of lines which are parallel to each other. Uh, and before I considered them uh, crossing lines, and now I have to color them differently. But each parallel class can contain at most omega parallel lines, right? Because now they are different. So I have to divide each color class into omega further uh, classes at most. And that's omega cube colors. Okay, that's enough about it. For segments, it's slightly more tricky. There are some other tricks and I don't want to go into the details because it's a little technical and we have this nasty omega cube term. But- uh, yeah, yes, can, I, can I ask you a question? Yes, please? yes. So uh, you were talking about proofs using partial orders. Yes. For this simpler case of, or if, even for the case of, uh, I don't know, projective space, uh, this omega squared result, can you prove it using some, uh, using some partial orders? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think we can define partial orders among these joint lines. Uh, just like for segments, we cannot, cannot, as far as I know, we couldn't define, couldn't decompose the disjointness, not to the disjointness uh, relation between lines, either in the Euclidean space or in the projective space, we cannot divide into uh, partial orders. Mm -hmm. okay. Somehow the, the intuition or counter intuition is that maybe one line is below the other one. This is not a proof. I am just saying that what is the difficulty? One line is below the other one. The other line is below the, the second one and can be still above the first one. Mm. 
This is definitely not a proof because you can define some more tricky uh, partial order, but somehow we couldn't avoid this problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, okay. What else? Yes, yes, yes. Now let's go back to the plane. So we <clears throat> this jointness graph. Uh, we we have seen that this jointness graph of segments in the plane is chi bounded, and the best bound we know is omega to the four. Now let's consider long V shapes, which means that uh, we, there is a segment plus a half line. This is the object, okay? And we consider this jointness graph of these things. And here we can prove that uh, uh, it is not chi bounded. And the way we proved it is realizing the shift graph. So let me it, let me tell you very briefly what is the shift graph uh, and with what property do we use. So the shift graph is uh, has well the vertices. Okay, shift graph f s n n is a parameter. The vertex it has n choose two vertices. Uh, a vertex is a Basically, it's an interval, it's a pair of numbers. So this is a vertex. Looks like an edge, but it's a vertex. So a vertex of the sheet graph is a pair of numbers, ij. That's the vertex. And so it has n choose two vertices. And two vertices are connected by an edge in these cases. So two such intervals are connected if one of them is the continuation of the other one. So one of them starts where the other one ends. Then they are connected by an edge. Otherwise, they are not connected. I think they, it was invented by Erdős and Karna, as far as I know. Uh, yes, so this is the shift graph. And it is very easy to see that there is no triangle in this graph. Basically, this is the proof. If So what would be a triangle? A triangle is three such intervals such that any for any two, one of them is the continuation of the other one. So you have two such intervals, and then where to put the third one? That was the precise proof, right? Because, yeah, you cannot have this. Uh, it is less trivial, but not, not hard to see that the chromatic number of this graph is approximately no graph. And I show you, I mean, uh, the idea, a sketch, let's say. I sketch how to realize this shift graph as a disjointness graph of these V shapes. We basically we use only one property of these shift graphs, the following. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to explain, but it's a very easy problem. Let's take the, the shift graph, let's order the vertices of the shift graph lexicographically. First J and then I. So this is the order. So first you take one, two, one, three, two, three, one, four. So this is the most important, this is the second important, okay? This is the order. Th that's how I ordered the vertices. And now, if you take, and I would, put- would you call, Wouldn't you call it co-lexicographic? Co-lexicographic, good, great, excellent. Thank you very much. Co-lexicographic, okay. And I call them V1, V2, and so on, according to this order, okay? And now, uh, if you take an inter, take one of these uh, vertices, say vi, any any vertex, it has some neighbors before i and before vi in this order, and has some neighbors after vi, right? In fact, in general. And the the point is that uh, it's not hard to see that the neighbors of vi before i, which means all those neighbors of vi, which have lower index, so neighbors of vi before vi uh, is an interval. It's uh, consistent of an interval. So neighbors of uh, vi before i, before vi, are between some va and vb, okay? Why is it true? This is vi, okay? Then this is the first neighbor, and this is the last neighbor. That's, that's, that's the observation. 
and all the other neighbors are, are the, on the other side, so they have higher neighbors. So they start here, but we are not in those. In so all neighbors of lower index are form an interval. And that's, that's the only property we use for the realization. And well, I don't want to go into the technical details. I just tell you the idea. So we add all these V shapes inductive. We want to have, and we assume that all of them look like this, that the half line has a positive slope, the segment has a slightly bigger positive slope, so they all look like this. And this, let's call it the vertex of the V shape. This vertex will always go as the I increases. This goes always down and also to the left. So the next vertex will be somewhere. Okay. And uh, okay. so that, that these are the properties. So they always go down, they always go to the left, and they all have uh, increase, they all have positive slopes. Actually, they have lower and lower and lower slopes. Well, lower and lower slopes meaning that the infinite part does not uh, they do not intersect like one infinite part cannot intersect another infinite part uh, it could actually you will see it in a second it could because uh, I see you because yeah I, I, I answer your question in the next sentence okay uh, so he, let's just see the recursive step okay not nothing complicated let's see the recursive step Suppose we already have, with all these properties, uh, we already have uh, all these V shapes until V i minus one. And now I want to add this V i, okay? That's my plan, to add the V i. And <clears throat> so what, what is the plan? I want to add the new V shape, which intersects. So this is the disjointness graph, remember? So these are exactly those which are disjoint from the new V shape, right? So it has to intersect everything up, uh, so B, B plus one up to V I minus one, all of these, these, and it also has to intersect V one and so on until V A minus one, okay? These are, these should be disjoint. Okay, and first of all, I take a horizontal line between V, the vertex of V B and V B plus one, okay? It's a horizontal line. And I, Tilt it a little bit so that it has a very, very little positive slope, but it's almost horizontal. Now let's and let's go very, very this way it is infinite, and this way I go somewhere extremely far away, very far away, so that it will be below all the previous endpoints. So this answers your question because this it these two half lines will intersect, right? It has lower slope. It starts below, but still the endpoint is below because it's somewhere far away here. So these two half lines will intersect each other. Is it okay? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So this line, well, now I still didn't tell, talk about the other, the, the segment part, just this line. This line will already intersect everything below. So V, B plus one, B plus two, and so on, B plus, I mean, I minus one. So this part is already okay, right? This part is okay. I still have to intersect these very little index parts, B, A minus one and so on. But so far this part is okay. So this half line is responsible for this part. Uh, and these V, B, B, A and so on, these are disjoint now at this point. Now let's, let's determine the slope of this. So I go extremely far away, extremely far away. And I determine the slope of this so that it intersects. I show you the next picture. Suppose this is extremely far. I this this is a segment. It looks like a half line, but actually this is a segment. Okay, I end it somewhere, <laughs> uh, and it will intersect all the half lines of v a minus one, a minus two, and so on. So as you decrease the index, they have higher and higher slope. Right, because these slopes are decreasing, so these have the highest slopes. So if you go, you choose a proper slope, and you are very, very far away, then you intersect exactly these half lines. V a minus one and so on. 
So this is responsible. So with this with this segment, uh, you intersect half lines also. So you do not count on intersecting between two segments. On intersection yes, between two segments, two. never intersect. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes. I mean, you never use it. Yeah. At least I don't use it. Yes, mm -hmm. and you can achieve that they don't intersect. Now the now so this half line is responsible for the high index uh, non neighbors, and the segment is intersect is responsible for the low index non neighbors. And these between are all disjoint. We are all inside this. Okay. Uh, now, so this is a real realization of the sheep graph. Uh, and here comes another problem, which we were thinking a lot about and we couldn't solve. Uh, notice that, uh, just oh, let me go back. Yes. So say this is VI and this is VB plus one. And this VB plus one, you cannot avoid that uh, this VB plus one, both the segment and the half line will intersect this, right? So they intersect twice. You cannot avoid it because maybe this segment has to go higher than this point. So you cannot, cannot, uh, cannot avoid the intersection. So these will intersect twice. So in some, some pairs, this means that some pairs will intersect twice. And we cannot do this construction uh, with the requirement that any two, if they intersect, they intersect only once. And that's a very exciting question. So can you uh, suppose that you have single crossing V shapes or long V shapes or whatever, uh, that class of this jointness graph is chi bounded or not? Or single cross. If instead of V shapes, you take uh, segments or uh, uh, polygonal chains of three segments, then it, then we know that you can do it with single crossing. So instead of V shapes, let's say Z shapes, which is three uh, segments, then we can do it with single crossing. Actually, it was done by. Uh, Sorry, I forgot the name. We did it with the four segments and uh, Mütze, Warchok, Beckert, I think. So they improved it to three segments. I forgot to write it here. But for two segments and single crossing, we cannot do it. We need two crossings. Okay. And uh, yes. So this is a very exciting question. And uh, one more thing. If you take double long V shapes, uh, so what is double long V shape? It means that uh, both, oh, both ends are half lines. So these are both half lines. Then the situation is different. Then it is chi bounded. And you can use the same idea as we did for segments. You, you, we have these four partial orders. Here you can do it with three partial orders. Basically, these are the three partial orders between so three partial orders between disjoint uh, V shapes, disjoint Vs. Basically, these, these are the three partial orders. Below and to the, it starts to the right, below and starts to the left, and inside. These are the three partial orders. It's very easy to see that all of them are partial orders. And uh, so this would give omega cube. Um, actually, <laughs> You can uh, use these partial orders with some work. Uh, you can use it for double long Z shape. So even if you can add the segment like this, so segment plus two infinite, uh, half, two half lines, still the same argument works. Still uh, omega cube. But if you, but what happens if you have two segments and two half lines? Then we can use the previous result. Then the answer is no. You, have, you can have this, uh, you, we have this set of V shapes, right? Long V shapes. And we can replace each of them by uh, tracing them twice. So uh, two half lines and two segments, replace each of these by these, okay? Then we have the same disjointness graph and then uh, we can prove that it's not chi bounded. So the limit is between the three and four. Okay, 
Okay, and I mentioned one more thing. I don't prove anything. I just mentioned one more interesting thing. Um, the girth of a graph is the length of the shorter cycle. And uh, Erdős and Tainal proved that uh, there are graphs of uh, arbitrarily large girth and arbitrarily large chromatic number. So this statement is strong, much stronger than uh, what we had for the sheaf graph and the others. For the sheaf graph and uh, whatever Zikov construction, uh, they had the property that there is no triangle and arbitrarily large chromatic number. Here, not just triangle, no short cycle and arbitrarily large chromatic number. So this is a much stronger property than before. So it's harder to realize, right? It's more special, it's st much stronger. And for Z shapes, so, uh, which means that, well, it doesn't look like a Z, but uh, still, and topologically, it's a Z. Actually, topologically, it is <laughs> anyway. So three segments, okay? It's a polygonal chain of three segments. Uh, finite, it's not infinite. So three, three normal segments, polygonal chain of three segments. Then the disjointness graph can even have this strong property, large girth and large chromatic number at the same time. Now I don't prove it because it's a little bit technical. We cannot do it. We cannot do it if any of these is infinite, and we cannot do it if if it's uh, just two segments. This is the the smallest one for which we can do it. And the idea the idea of the proof is, comes from another proof of James Davis, a very nice proof of James Davis. And I I don't uh, tell you his proof. I just tell his Tell one tool and the result. What it is. So this result is based on the following. What I'm saying here. And n, you, so this is the tool. An n-uniform hypergraph is just a hypergraph where set system where each set has n vertices. And uh, we say that n, say g, uh, g hyperedges form a cycle. If this is the situation, what you can see here. Uh, in other words, there are vertices V1, V2, Vg, such that, say, Vi and Vi plus 1 is in an, in an hyper edge Ei. It doesn't matter if other vertices are also in Ei, it doesn't matter, but these two are definitely in Ei. So Vi plus 1, Vi plus 2 is in Ei plus 1, and so on. Then we say that they form a cycle, okay? And uh, so it's it's a it's a bird cycle, right? Yes, yes, yes. And okay, this was one, this was a definition, and now I tell you two theorems. First, Dalai he proved that uh, if you take a finite point set, say P uh, in the D-dimensional space, it doesn't matter. You can even consider it in the plane, it doesn't matter. Well, even in the line. In the line. It's, it's enough. <laughs> okay, in the line. But uh, well, I say it in the full generality in D dimensions. So, finite set in the D dimensional space. Then there is another finite set, which is a huge, huge set in the D dimensional space, such that for every K coloring of the points of uh, X, there is a monochromatic homothetic copy of T. Homothetic means uh, you can use translation and scale, no rotation. Is it okay? Uh, that's what Gala is doing. So for any point set, you can take a huge point set, which always contains a mono monochromatic homothetic copy of T for any K coloring. And uh, Prümel and Foyt, uh, generalized it in the following way. The same is true, so this X exists, uh, with the additional condition that uh, if you take all the homothetic copies of T in this set X, that's a hypergraph, right? You take all the homothetic copies, and this, this hypergraph, these homothetic copies don't form a cycle of length G 
or less. There, there is no short bear cycle in this hypergraph. Uh, so they can construct an X with this additional property. Okay? And with these, James proved the following uh, two results using, actually he used it for many other things. I'm just mentioning these two. Uh, he proved that the intersection graph of axis parallel boxes in a space, three-dimensional space, can have arbitrary large girths and arbitrary large chromatic number. Somehow he used this result uh, and the recur recursive, he made the recursive construction. So this is a strengthening of uh, the, the Berlin construction, which has started. Berlin proved the same thing, but instead of large girths, he just proved that there is no, with the property that there is no triangle. And Davis uh, improved it to large girths. Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, can you repeat, maybe I missed it. Uh, so, what does it mean that they form a cycle? Like, in which uh, graph again? Like, uh, in in the in the uh, in the premier yeah, yeah. intersection graph. Uh, intersection graph uh, in both. Uh, yeah, so this is a normal. It's not a hypergraph now. It is a normal graph mm. and mm -hmm. a traditional cycle. I mean, uh, just a cycle in the most conservative way. So you, he, he managed to construct uh, axis parallel boxes uh, okay. so that the intersection graph has very large girls and very large chromatic numbers. Okay, okay. And, and this is an improvement of Burnham's regard. Uh, and he used exact the same thing, uh, absolutely the same, to prove that the following very similar result, he can uh, construct lines in R cube so that their intersection graph has exactly the same property, large girls and large chromatic number. And the construction is basically the same. That's it. Uh, so we were talking about disjointed graphs of lines in the previous slides. This is the intersection graph of lines. Before him, Sergei Norin proved uh, that intersection graph of lines can have, uh, it's possible that it doesn't, it's not chi bounded. So it's possible that it doesn't contain a triangle and still arbitrary large chromatic number. That was proved by Sergei Norin. And this is an improvement because it even has a large curve. Okay. And I finish with one more problem. Actually, I already mentioned it. that uh, oh, it's V shape. So we, we proved a similar thing for uh, polygonal chains of three segments, and we couldn't prove it for two segments. For two segments, V shapes, let's say. We know that it can have, uh, it's not chi bounded, no triangle and arbitrary large chromatic number, but we don't know if it can have arbitrary large curves. So that, that case remains open. I think it's an excess problem. I think this was the last, yeah, this was the last. Okay. So that's it. Thank Thanks. Thanks a lot, Geza. Thank you very uh, much. For, for a great talk. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Gisela. Thank you. So in your construction, Gisela, in this, uh, in this uh, where you realize this shift graph. So shift graphs, what is the situation on cycles with the, with the shift graph? Uh, so how long cycles are there? Yeah, like, uh, do you have all, uh, do you have any odd cycles? Yeah. Uh, let's see. It's easy to get rid of them. And that's, that's what I remember. Let me make a few, just a second. I don't, I don't know. I, I think there is no induced. I think there is no induced cycle. Uh, I mean, in a shift graph, uh, yeah, okay, there is no induced. Uh, 
There are lots of lots of even cycles, but there uh, the odd cycle. There are five cycles yes. in the shift graph. Uh huh. There are five cycles. Uh, okay. But you can get rid of the first few, so you can make it like a, a subgraph of the shift graph where all the first odd cycle has like high high length. Okay. Okay. And in general, are there any like intermediate results when you can get rid of some cycles like odd cycles, or, but you cannot get rid of all even cycles, uh, like classes of uh, uh, geometric graphs where, where you know that they're chi bounded or not chi bounded, you even can get rid of say odd cycles, but you cannot get rid of all cycles or something like that. I don't know any such. Like for this is this is what happens for Knezer graphs, for example. For Knezer graphs, you can get rid of all odd cycles right? and you can get large chromatic number, but um, getting like without deleting any edges, but getting rid of even cycles is yeah, it's harder. Oh yeah. I, I don't know. I, in this shape graphs, we can get rid of the so what, what okay, so this, their order even doesn't matter that much as far as understood cover, just short. It does matter. You cannot get ah. rid of the even cycles. Ah, okay, you can get, of, get rid of, of short even, odd cycles. Okay. Lots of cycles of length four and there is no way to get rid of them. Okay, okay. But okay. you can get rid of the short odd cycles and it okay. still be, will be a high chromatic. Yeah. Ah, okay, so then this, uh, this is... Uh, um, any other questions? Okay, so if not, then thanks a lot, Geza, for, uh, for the Thank talk. Thank you very and, much. Thank you very uh, much. Hope to see you in Hungary if this would be possible, you know, this summer. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you, Geza. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye, Geza. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.